chapter 15 and governing the cloud. So governance is a thing. Governance is a really big thing. So corporate governance is how we make sure we do all of our due diligence and all the other things around meeting our legal, regulatory, and industry standard responses. Our business strategy, and we need to have examples of strategic goals around how we're going to do corporate governance. So discuss how companies use the capability maturity model to measure their current capabilities. So CMM is a really interesting baseline to study how you do things. Define and describe internal controls. Describe and define IT governance. Discuss the various types of governance the company must perform. Discuss the role of Sarbanes-Oxley in corporate IT governance. SOX is an interesting law. If you have not run into it before, it's good from a cloud um, viewpoint to really understand how it works. And then discuss factors to consider when developing governance procedures for the clouds. So what's interesting about this is that we all have risks and challenges with cloud computing, um, just like anything else that you've got. You do have an increased tax surface that you're not used to. Um, definitely, especially storing and protecting data. Um, usually you're doing it inside your own data center. You don't have an attack service for your network attached storage, but you certainly do for your S3 bucket or other buckets, right? You don't have an attack surface for some of the other things like your tape backups. No one's going to steal your snapshots from the inside your own data center, right? You do in the cloud. There's an issue there and something you need to address. Now, you do have a shared responsibility model with the cloud provider, and the shared responsibility model is a discussion in its own right. You have an expansion of trust boundaries, and not just within your own company and the cloud provider, but anyone you're getting API services from, like your pay payment processor, your um, anybody else, if you're doing cloud-based HR, right? All of a sudden, you've opened up your entire HR system to a third party, and you don't have a lot of control over how that third party runs. So that can be really interesting. And then there's vendor access to the organization's data that can be problematic as well, right? Now, not that the vendor is gonna do a lot of things, but the fact is, unless you encrypt it with your own keys, the vendor might be able to get in there and take a look around. Now, the vendor isn't gonna tell you if they do it, but they'll probably fire the employee for doing it. You do have reduced operational governance control, right? Usually less than on-premise IT resources. You don't get to tell Amazon how they're going to run their cloud. <laughs> you don't. You don't get to tell Microsoft or Google how they're going to run their cloud. Now, they will tell you that they meet certain compliance requirements, whether it's HIPAA, SOX, SOC2, um, any one of the ones that you've got that you need to meet for audit and compliance and everything else. Right? So, make sure that you do understand that you do lose some control and for anyone that's a control freak in the industry especially your audit department make sure they understand that there's a lack of standards and customized inter integration now we're working on those standards right we're working on those now and you can actually help set those there's some really interesting discussions now going on in acm on what those standards should look like and portability between cloud providers what does a fully portable well-architected framework look like so cloud architecture frameworks are really the big thing right now. They're a lot of fun to work on. And then multi-regional compliance and legal issues. Man, introducing stuff from China or from Saudi Arabia, from Germany. And you can obviously tell I keep on tagging on these because this is honestly where I have been, right? Trying to work through how you do data, how you segregate data, how you geofence data, how you geofence users. What happens if that German family comes to Disneyland and they want to share the stuff that they did at Disneyland with all their family back in Germany while well, the data is going to reside in the United States and in Germany and wow kettle o worms honestly so multi-regional compliance and legal issues really become a thing um, it becomes some really interesting jurisdictional issues which is generally why we just default to okay GDPR is my toughest security or my toughest privacy regulation so we'll just apply that everywhere we'll apply it to Americans we'll apply it to uh, Japanese uh, we won't apply it to the Chinese because the Chinese don't have any kind of privacy regulations and they have specific requirements for being in their environment especially around data so multi-regional compliance and legal issues are huge and then there's the need for true financials, right? Following the dot-com crash, you really can't trust a lot of things, right? Enron, Tyco, Rocom, pressures of the government, shareholders. We have the problems now, then we had, after that, we had the housing crisis bubble go. We've got issues going on now where we're seeing opportunities for fraud and lack of oversight. So we're still trying to figure out how we're gonna restore confidence in corporate financial reporting 
along the way and we're trying to really work out on true financials and how that all works because most of the data that drives corporate financial can originate within data centers if it's in the cloud and it's subject to manipulation you can get some really interesting and false data right the new era of governance has brought greater visibility and greater need for controls to IT departments especially understanding how data is accessed who accesses it when it's accessed and who has early access to the data one of the most interesting things that you will note about the collapse of Enron is in the IT department at the lower level, they all sold their stock anywhere between one week to two weeks before the company collapsed. So they still got a pretty good stock price where most people were left holding the bag. And it's because the IT department saw what was going on and were able to discuss it. And that's a violation of controls. So that's an insider trading that's bad all the way around. But by the time they figured it out, everyone had gone. No one cared. Right? So corporate governance combines processes, policies, laws, and controls that affect how a company operates. So this is your legal department, your audit department, your board, your senior executive staff, your CSO level things, your senior VPs. All of these people are defining those processes, policies, and laws at the strategic level to affect how a company operates. Governance guides the company's decision making and administrative processes and that includes policies. So if you have a user password policy. It came out of corporate governance. Corporate governance is complex, involves a lot of people, processes, systems, and more. It is a really complicated dance of differing needs, desires, and wants. The thing about being in IT is you're going to be implementing this stuff at the tactical level. Right, so strategic is basically saying, okay, I have this federal regulation. It has to look like this when we implement it. So I'll need a policy and procedure on user passwords. I'll need an acceptable use policy for the network. From the tactical viewpoint, you're gonna say, okay, we need complex passwords. I'm gonna go make sure that my Active Directory is set to require complex passwords. Oh, I need an acceptable use policy. Well, I'll send that over to my policy people on the IT side and they'll make a policy about um, can't surf this, can't do that, use only for business purposes, be careful who you go, don't go to bad websites, um, you know, make sure you use multi-factor authentication, all that kind of stuff. And then that will satisfy the strategic requirement for that need for that policy or that procedure. So corporate governance is really broken down into strategic and tactical. Right? So the components of this, again, are your board, your management, your system policies and controls. And these can be technical controls or these can be policy controls. So make sure you understand how that all works from technical controls, implement a policy control. Credit, creditors, stakeholders, employees, vendors, suppliers are all in there, but they're all put pressured on by government and legal requirements, and that can be any government and any legal, and then shareholders. It's interesting that shareholders hold up here because you might have activist shareholders that want you to do things a certain way that may be contrary to what government or legal wants. Right? And their shareholders may say, oh, I want you to use more green energy and I want you to blah, blah, blah. And that's good, you should, but there may not be an economic incentive to do so unless government steps in and goes, hey, you know, we'll cut you a deal. If you buy this uh, solar power and try to go to your data center to be 100% solar, um, non-fossil fuel, you'll make your shareholders happy. And it'll be, oh, yeah, I'll take that. that. And the legal department will go, okay, well, what does that do to my capital expenses? What does that do to any other kind of agreement that I have with anybody else? So legal will review that to make sure it actually does what it needs to do. So that's how shareholders, government, and legal can put pressure inside on things to get a change. And sometimes the changes are, are really simple, really good, sort of like going to solar or non-fossil fuel for your data center. It just makes it kind of interesting because your board has to approve it in the final end. Right. The real world organization for economic cooperation, you may actually do stuff with these guys and they're really interesting to work with. OC, OECD, they publish principles on corporate development and it's been revised to address corporate governance issues, including cloud computing. Cloud computing really raises some interesting corporate governance issues. So the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development is really kind of starting to set down some standards. So if you take a look at IT21, which is the Indian IT policy, you take a look at Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's policy for cloud computing, you take a look at Germany's policy for cloud computing, you're going to see some commonalities above those. And those are all coming out of OECD or they're coming out of the Cloud Security Alliance. So these people really do help influence governments to do corporate governance issues and make legal rules or other things around it, especially on data privacy, data segregation, and data use. And data is king now. Data is really the one thing that you really want to be able to do. 
So you have to understand the business strategy as an IT person so that you can start going from strategic to tactical. A strategy is a plan of action designed to achieve one or more particular goals. It's really vague. It's really high level. Now, you as a manager or you as an IT person are going to be making those plans to execute and achieve those business goals. Right? So you are going to design a cloud computing object to allow people to input data. And from that data, the company will be able to then ship you a product. Right? That's a pretty easy strategy. It's an e-commerce strategy. But now we need to break that out into steps. We need to turn that into a project. We need to make sure it happens. And we need to make sure that we achieve our business goal of making money enough that the company survives and shows a profit. So components of a business strategy. The big focus right now in this era that we live in is on the shareholder value where 40 years ago the focus was on something else, a little bit different, making sure the, the company had a lot of money for research and development. We don't research and development so much now as we pay shareholders. So right now, the component of a business strategy is maximizing shareholder value, but that's sure starting to shift back now. It's starting to shift back to where we were in the 50s and the 60s, where we're seeing a lot more original research and we're starting to see an increase in unionization. And that will change your business strategy, believe it or not. Reducing or managing, reducing or managing costs to maximize profits, that's always a given. That's always gonna to need to be. We're always gonna to need to make money on whatever we do. Then we need to provide a high quality work environment to attract and retain employees. Now the cloud and your remote collaboration tools and working from home may actually be that high quality work environment to attract and retain employees, right? You can only offer so much pizza. If the office is a horrible place to go, you're gonna lose employees. So making sure that your employees have the right hardware, have the right collaboration tools, or the right cloud strategy for doing all the things, whether it's Zoom or Teams or whatever, that's huge, right? Maintaining a high degree of customer satisfaction, making sure customers can get in, do their thing, get their product and walk out the door, that's great, right? If it's a digital download, that's even better, right? Because then I can just go listen to my music right now. That's what I love about the Apple Store. I can just go buy my music and run and go run with it and just go play it and put it on my iPhone it automatically goes onto my iPhone everybody's happy right supporting environmentally friendly operation that includes green that includes making sure you're not using a bunch of toxic chemicals that's all of the EPA things you want to pay attention to especially if you've got your own data center because you are going to have things like halon or co2 you're going to have diesel generators you're going to have all these other things that will have a effect on the environment Developing a sustainable competitive advantage. This is the goal of every company ever. Sustainable competitive advantage. And that means keeping your products fresh. That means keeping your database fresh. That means keeping your websites fresh. That means making sure everybody is happy with what you're doing and that you're showing a growth curve. And then provide accurate reporting of company operations. The cloud, just like any other system, kind of opens up this door to having data munched around with. And there are some people that make really, really beautiful predictive models for where the company is going and what the company products are doing. And those models are too optimistic. The company will never realize those goals, right? So it's interesting that when you're providing accurate reporting of company operations, that is really super important to be 100% accurate in what you're doing, even if it's bad news. So the capability maturity model will help you do this. It's to help business measure and improve their current capabilities. So this is actually really kind of an interesting thing. I've been working with this for almost 20 years now. Um, there's some really interesting additions coming out now from the government, from the federal government that manages this. So as business matures and skills improve, a company's CMM score should increase, but only if you're staying in the same product range. You may acquire a company. You may come up with a new product. So you basically are going to have composite scores all over the place, depending on what section of the company you're looking at. So as scores increase, so too should the predictability and reliability of the business. But that's not always the case. Something weird happens. So going back in and using data analytics, can help you with your capability maturity model and data analytics. There is nothing better for the cloud than a good data analytics package, right? The cloud really helps you understand and be able to process the sheer amount of volume of data that's coming in from an organization now, because we are making terabits of data every month in a, in a company, if not every day, depending on what you've got cooking. Right? So there are very different levels within the capability and maturity model. You should know what these are in general. 
right? That it's an initial level. Processes are typically changing. Those are static, likely undocumented. You know, many operations are reactive. We're a new startup. We're just getting kicked off. We're doing good things. We've got our first big contract. All right. Oh, well, I need policies. Oh, that first contract requires me to have some kind of security around my database. Oh, it's classified information. Right, so initial level one means you're reacting to all the requirements and you may or may not be fast enough to do the things you need to do. Now, two, some processes are repeatable, uh, dealing with consistent results. Uh, you're still gonna have defined systems or processes still lacking, right? And then defined, many processes are now static and documented. Most of the companies we work for are here, are at three defined. They're static and documented, but some processes are under evaluation for improvement or I'm launching a new product or I'm making a big process business change or I'm moving to the cloud or something else. Most of your companies are gonna be at three or four. Most processes are controlled and adjusted to improve quality. There's some kind of TQL, TQM process going on, TQI, um, some kind of root cause analysis process going on in there as well. Um, that's really uncommon in a lot of ways, but it is somewhat common. So probably say 50-50. That's a flip of a coin on that one. And then optimize continuous improvement of existing processes. This is only for the most stable of products, right? This is for something that you've been around for a long time. So I don't know of anybody that's really optimized that's just focused on continuous improvement of existing processes, right? I'm sure there's someone out there, but most of the companies I work with are in level three or level four. I've worked with a few startups. They are a blast to work with, but they have got a high overhead. They need a lot of care and feeding startups do. So if you get the opportunity to work with a startup, take it, just be really prepared for having a lot of chaos in, in your day, right? So inspect what you expect. And this is a really good phrase. Just remember that you, you should use this, inspect what you expect. Once a company defines its business goals and metrics, it must inspect the underlying factors that drive those results, right? And that's people, that's money, that's product, that's process, that's creative cycle, that's a developmental cycle. And rather than take its financials at face value, you really should examine all the sources from which values are derived to ensure that each is accurate and free from fraud. And this is known as auditing but it's a full, total, complete system audit. Everything you would ever want to know about your company. It's kind of expensive if you're having an outside third party do it, but it's a really important way of making sure that you are getting value out of as much stuff as you possibly can. If you have a one-off product that you know is only gonna go once and never go again, don't put a whole lot of effort into it. Make it just as minimal viable product, right? But if you have a flagship product that you're really super proud of and you're working really, really hard on, it may have spin-off opportunities. There may be other parts of that that's really super valuable that can be fitted into other products or in its own right can be a standalone product. So you may have uh, an entry level edition, you may have a regular edition, a single user edition, you may have an enterprise edition that's got all the whistles, buzzers, and bells. So you can drive different levels of value from that flagship product as you go through, and the cloud can help you get there by providing a lot of the backend support and infrastructure regardless of the version that you buy. So auditing, a lot of people don't like auditors, but you, they're fun. They're great people to work with. They've got a very different look and viewpoint on it because they're gonna be looking at the company, but they're looking at it from that viewpoint of what's measured, what's valuable, what's reportable, and what do I need to do to meet certain regulatory and legal requirements? So they'll work in touch in tandem with legal, and they really should be working in tandem with IT department as well, because you're gonna be designing a lot of the controls, those technical controls and procedural controls over the things that the company needs to audit, those things that they measure and report using internal or external auditors. Third-party auditors are going to come in. They're going to want to see all your controls around things, make sure you've got firewalls, make sure you've got security access lists, all those things. Your internal audit department is going to want those same things. So an internal control allows a company auditor to inspect data values at key stages, so time over processing. Now, internal controls are really kind of straightforward. Those are things like yeah, acceptable use policies or things like firewalls or things like switches and network access control lists. Those are things like how do you do DNS? Is it secure DNS? You only use a solid provider for DNS. All those processes that go in place for what you're going to do. All those things are internal controls. They tell you how you're going to run and how you're going to measure and maintain those controls to make sure that they stay in place so you can meet your regulatory and commercial framework. So you can actually take a look at some of the stuff for the Committee for Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission. It has a defined model that companies can use to define their internal controls. So as an IT person, if your IT department is not using this, you have to download a copy, see where you fit in, right? See if your auditing department's using this. If your auditing department is not using the, the COSO model, 
find out what model they're using and then go through and do a, your own audit on this, right? Work with your audit department because the stronger your connection is between audit, legal, and all the controls you're building as an IT department, the easier it is to go through an audit. Your audits are gonna go a lot quicker, a lot faster, a lot easier, and you're gonna understand a whole lot more about your company and the business and the things that you're supporting. And then it's easier to show real value, right? A lot of people will look at your security department and go, well, what have they done for me lately? Well, if you know how many attacks have hit your company that didn't go anywhere, there's your metric right there, right? And that's a good metric to have. It freaks people out. Those are always fun. So the COSA model, right, is basically it kind of sets down what the components are and how that model works. So if you've got an internal environment, the organization creates an environment supportive controls, includes ethical operations, managerial technology, compliant operations. So everyone's working together to try to make all of your security groups and everything else, both technical and procedural controls work. Objective setting, the business establishes defined and measurable objectives for operations, KPIs. I'm going to make sure that my bandwidth never hits this, or I'm going to use this QoS setting for my voice over IP so I never drop a phone, right? And all those other things. So all these components will help you audit what you've got going on. And it makes it a lot easier to figure out if you're meeting legal and regulatory compliance. Your audit team and your legal team can help here to make sure you're there. But the more you understand in IT and in the cloud, understand how audit works, the easier it's going to be to move your stuff into the cloud, the easier it's going to be to audit all these control activities, information and communication and monitoring, and bring those back so you can actually give your audit department their own dashboard and just make them happy and joyous that they have their own data pool. They don't have to pester you for data. They can just go pull it up themselves. And the good part about it is you can probably put a control in there that really limits the access to what the audit department can do. You can leave them as read only to a lot of data, make it so that they can write maybe minimal dashboards, but just give them a, a handy set of dashboards and if they need something, they'll reach out to you. But yeah, that way you can kind of keep your audit department on a leash too, because they will want to expand their access every time they can, because that's what they do. Control objectives for information and related technology, COBIT. COBIT's a little bit older framework by ISACA, IASCA, and it is a little bit older one. It's not applicable to everything, but it really is more about a governance framework for audit control. Right. It defines dozens of processes that IT manager and staff can use to plan, acquire, implement, deliver, support, monitor, and evaluate IT solutions. They're still working on getting it into the cloud. And again, COBIT's a little bit older, but it's still one that's used a lot. It's kind of an interesting one to take a look at. So IT governance is one of many key types of governance inside a company that they need to take a look at. There are a lot of different kinds of governance. You're just that little box down there that says IT. That's it. So that's your role. It's a good role to be in. Intellectual property is another fun one to be in. I've worked in that one. That's great. Vendors is fun. Customers are fun. All these are fun. And as you get into the cloud, you're going to find out you're going to be working with a lot more of these. The cloud really expands the roles that you've got cooking, right? So you can be in IT, helping people with intellectual property and vendors and relationships and people. Um, your finances are going to change. You can help with strategy and make sure that ethics are programmed in. So there's lots of neat things that you can do here with IT governance. The cloud just allows you to just kind of go hyper on it. So you can actually go and start tearing things apart and having more fun with it. Now, the aftermath of the dot-com crash, and that included Enron, Tyco, WorldCom, a whole bunch of people were like really upset going, what do you mean the data was fake? What do you mean that people were actually putting out false affidavits that the companies were profitable? And that really caused some problems. So we now have Sarbanes-Oxley, and this is a law to improve confidence in the truthfulness of company reporting by requiring greater transparency and controls that the data that the companies report. As an IT person in the cloud and in regular IT, you are going to play a big part in making sure that Sarbanes-Oxley actually works the way it's intended to. So the IT Governance Institute was formed in 1998 to assist businesses in aligning IT solutions with business strategies and how to achieve compliance with HIPAA, FERPA, Sarbanes-Oxley, Gramm-Leach-Bliley, GDPR, a lot of the other roles that we work with. If you are in healthcare or you are in nuclear, you have a whole different set of rules. You have industry standards like PCI DSS. The IT Governance Institute can help you here with all their practices, best practices, and it's all on global basis. Right, so you're in the cloud, you're going to be global anyways. You might as well use systems that are available to you. Do not reinvent the wheel here. 
right? They have best practices in case studies and research papers. You really should get to know them a lot better. Now, what kind of complicates things, though, is remember, you're not going to tell Microsoft or Google or Amazon how they're going to run their cloud. They're going to tell you how that is going to work, the things that they will do. So the big thing about this SLA governance considerations is who the company can access the service, right? And what role do they have? Are they administrators? Are they users? Are they data users? Where do they go? And who within the cloud provider can access the service? You have to pretty much so assume that anyone with an admin level credential can access anything from the hypervisor on down, which means they could technically do things that you will never know about, right? They could technically make a snapshot of your system and your data and go through and comb it, right? And there are specific laws in place that give that as an exclusive right to government in the course of an investigation, right? That is another big thing with SLA. The government can come and take a copy of your data and never let you know about it in the cloud. The, they may be underneath a gag order, the cloud provider, to not tell you that they did this. If it's in your own data center, someone's going to know that the government wants a copy of your data. So interesting. And we see that a lot with people as well. What's the first thing law enforcement wants? They want your iPhone data. They also want your iPhone backup, just in case. Right, so interesting. Who can access the service and what do they do? Law enforcement is a whole different thing on this one. Is the solution multi-tenant? Is the service secured? How are we using crypto? What does our crypto keys look like? How are we rotating them out? Is the service replicated or co-located? Am I using a hybrid? Do I have my own data center in here? How can the service be tested and validated? And what is the service uptime? Now, a lot of companies will go and do the provision of turning their network data centers into just giganto data storage to make sure that people can't get to their data and then just use the web for or use the cloud for processing or use web apps to make sure that their customers are used so there's some real big sla governance considerations especially when it comes to who gets access to it and then special carve outs for law enforcement right how and when is the service maintained who's doing that is it PaaS or platform as a service software as a service what controls can be implemented and at what stages so if it's software as a service you're not going to implement a whole lot of controls outside of user access controls if you're doing infrastructure as a service you get all the controls that you can implement as you want to up through the hypervisor on up anything below that you can't do a control on you're not going to get controls on the hardware how are errors and exceptions logged? Are we even doing a try catch on our errors? We want to make sure that we're getting those, right? How can performance be monitored? Well, that's at least pretty easy. You can make some really nice dashboards on that. But how do you maintain a historical dashboard becomes an interesting complication to this. What is upgrading and versioning process? That can be huge because you can break things by doing upgrading and going to a different version. And then what kind of auditing support is supported? So there's a lot of things in your SLA and your governance, and it's almost like reinventing your entire company when you move to the cloud. You literally need to understand more about your company than you probably ever really wanted to know. And that's why going to the cloud is really a whole company exercise. It's not just IT. It's not just your developers out there going and doing a thing, thinking it would be cool to make it really valuable to the business. It has to be a whole business case. It has to be everyone in the company wants to go there or is willing to go there and is willing to do the things they need to do to make sure they get there. So when you start getting into these kinds of level of if discussions, when you start getting into governance and compliance, it really is a board CXO, senior staff driven exercise where everything then goes downhill from strategic to tactical, from here's the idea to here's how I'm going to implement it. This is the fun part of the job, taking that data, taking that idea and saying, I want to do X and actually converting it into a viable application, a viable service, something either for your internal customers or for your external customers. So lots of things to consider when you get to this point in your build. So some key terms that you're going to want to know for this. Auditing. Auditing is your friends. A business strategy. You really do need to understand why you're in business and what you hope to do with your cloud solution. Corporate governance, internal control, and then IT governance. So I really want to thank you for sitting through this lecture. This was kind of fun. This is a good part to talk about when you get into corporate governance and how things are supposed to work versus how they actually really work and then how do you validate things working the way they need to. So thank you for sitting through this lecture. I will see you in the next one.